guy stands on top of a mountain and makes an unsuccessful attempt to create a super heavy sword with a density like a neural star. He doubts the success of his magic and believes that he will not be able to fight on equal terms with the perfect ones. The guy recalls his childhood, as many of his peers reported their weaknesses. Someone was poorly oriented in the area, someone could not die because of their family. And now the guy thinks that there are certain limitations for him, a loner. He comes to the conclusion that he needs to find comrades, and decides to go to a densely populated city. The guy takes off, but sees a strange rift in front of him. He does not understand where this distortion of time and space came from. The guy thinks that if it starts sucking everything around, then there will be trouble. Suddenly, to his amazement, a woman's hand reaches out from the rift. A girl appears from the rift. The guy asks her name in surprise, and the girl introduces herself as Rija, the goddess of invocations. The guy is surprised that Rija called herself a goddess, and asks again what she means. Rija explains that she is a goddess in another world, different from this one, and is looking for a hero to summon. Her place of arrival should be next to the strongest person in each of the worlds, and maybe this guy is it. He still does not believe and believes that he is being bullied by children's fairy tales. However, Rissia, having read his thoughts, objects, which shocks the guy, because Rissia was able to get through his anti-magic. The guy introduces himself as Razel, the strongest man in this world. He asks Rija if he is worthy to embark on the path of a hero with her, thinking that, with her support, he will be able to overcome the perfect ones. Rija rejoices at Rizal's agreement, who asks about what needs to be done. Rija explains that Razel will have to follow the king's instructions and defeat the demon king. Razel agrees, but is inwardly stunned and does not understand which demon king she is talking about. Rija points to the rift and asks Razel if he is ready. Razel is ready, and they are sucked into the rift. Razel gets scared, but comes to the conclusion that those who do not take risks do not drink champagne, and stops resisting. Razel finds himself in the throne room. The king sits on the throne. Razel sees that this is a different world. The king greets Razel and introduces himself to him as the king of the country, the one who summoned Razel. Razel notices three people at the wall. A bald guy, a long-haired guy and a boy with glasses. Razel mentally understands that he is not the only one who has been called. A man with a beard asks a blonde guy that only four people were called this time, and he answers in the affirmative. So Razel realizes that these are the same heroes as him. But, scanning with his vision, Razel notices that these heroes do not have enough mana, surprised that they were the strongest in each of their worlds. Razel snaps her fingers to see their status, but he is interrupted by a blonde man to talk about their world, and Razel decides to listen. The blonde man says that their world is inhabited by three races, humans, demi-humans and demons. There are few half-humans, and they don't really pose a threat. Razel notices that so far everything looks like his world. But the blonde one goes to the demons. He says that humans and demons have been fighting for many years, but the power of the latter has suddenly increased recently, and people are subordinate to them. The blonde man announces the names of the heroes. He calls the boy a civil servant fraud. Ambala introduces Rial as an adventurer. The long-haired man is called a mercenary by Banza. Rizal is described as an unknown. Razel dreams of becoming a famous and revered demon hunter in many countries in the future. The blonde man declares that he hopes for support in eliminating the demon race, and after that each of the heroes will be able to live a life without worries. Fraud says that life without worries is tempting for him. Rial considers the offer a good test of his strength. Banza decides that since demons are the enemies of humanity, he will end them without question. Razel is silent. The maid rolls out a table with something covered with a towel. The blonde man announces an aptitude test and asks to put his hand to the crystal ball. The towel is removed, and there is a crystal ball on the table. The blonde-haired man says that the results of the test will be combat skills. The ball will not calculate anything specific with its formula. Razel thinks they want to convert the amount of mana and magic power into numbers using a formula. Rial says that he was called first, and puts his hand on the ball. The ball is glowing. Rial doesn't understand what's going on. The blonde man screams in surprise, not believing what he sees, and Rial asks him what it is. The blonde man admiringly declares that the combat strength of the Rial is 4097. The king and Rasil are happy about this. Rizal does not understand and mentally tries to figure out how big this number is. Fraud says that it's his turn next, and goes to the ball. Fraud puts his hand on the ball, and his fighting strength is 3664. He is told that he is also strong. 
Fraud reacts calmly. Banza puts his hand on the third, and his value is 3776. The blonde man admires, emphasizing that this is what should be expected from the heroes. He invites Rizal. Rizal approaches the ball, mentally asking what he can't calculate specifically. The characters are looking at him. Rizal puts his hand up. Nothing happens. Rizal says the balloon is not responding. The blonde man asks again in surprise. He nervously examines the ball and comes to the conclusion that it may have broken. But when Rizal asks what's the matter, the blonde man says that everything is fine and offers to try again. Rizal puts his hand up, and the blonde man says that his fighting strength is zero. The king angrily asks again, and the blonde man repeats, answering that the crystal is not damaged in any way. Rizal wants to answer about the crystal. But the king does not want to listen to him and throws him out, shouting that he does not recognize someone with zero mana as a hero. Rizal says there's been some kind of mistake. He desperately thinks that there is really nothing to do. And he notices the fireplace. Rizal runs to the fireplace, drawing everyone's attention to him. He picks up a piece of coal, considering that the atomic reconstruction technique contains about 7,000 combat forces, and this is the perfect way to show what he is capable of. Rizal turns coal into diamond. The blonde man asks in surprise what he saw. Rizal shows the diamond to everyone and asks if they realize that he has magic. But the king is even more angry. He shouts that there is no such technique that turns coal into diamond, which puts Rizal at a loss. Rizal replies that this is a common technique. He wonders in his mind, does this technique exist only in his world? The king shuts Razel up, calls him a useless swindler and expels him from the castle. The heroes make fun of Razel. Razel thinks that really no one knows such a technique. He turns to Rija, but she stands speechless. The king orders the blonde man to call the guards, and he runs away. The guards kick Razel out, telling him to take his stone and not to appear on the castle doorstep anymore. An empty city, Razel sits sadly by the fountain. A mother and daughter walk by, who notices him and asks his mother what's wrong with him. The mother accelerates her pace and tells her daughter not to look at him. Razel does not understand what to do next. He remembers the king's cry and cannot believe that he was dared to be kicked out in such disgrace. Razel decides to change the subject. He believes that he needs to think about further actions, but at the moment he wants to make sure of something. He goes into the tool shop. The master greets Razel, noting that he has not seen him before. Razel puts down the diamond. The master calls him handsome. Razel offers to buy. The master asks why Razel doesn't go to the jewelry store. But Razel thinks that jewelers may consider him a fraud, and confesses to the master the artificiality of the diamond. He asks the foreman about the shops that accept fakes, but he is outraged. Razel suggests using jewelry in industry, for example, as a cutter. The master again indignantly says that if Razel sells the diamond to jewelers, he will be able to live happily for many years, and Razel understands that no one in this world fakes stones. But he wants to sell the stone as soon as possible, and the idea of its artificiality is disgusting to Razel. He asks how much a night at the hotel will cost, and the master answers that about 10,000 shares. Razel offers to buy the diamond for 70,000, and the master is shocked. He is angry at Rizal, who replies that he does not want people to think he is a fraud when they learn to distinguish the artificiality of diamonds. The master refuses, fearing that he will be suspected of cheating. Razal offers a deposit of 70,000, and the master agrees. They shake hands. Razal walks down the street and counts coins, thinking that alchemy in this world is not developed. The currency system is completely different, and there is a long way ahead. Razel is standing in front of the counter at Mary's hotel, and he is offered 7,000 shares without food. He lies on the bed, exclaiming that he is very tired and finds himself in a strange world. He decides to put his thoughts in order. He reflects that he did not believe that Rija was a deity from another world. He believes that she used an interdimensional summoning spell, and not a temporary displacement, as he thought. Razel remembers the workshop and realizes that the level of magic is different from his world. He jumps up and wonders if this world is parallel. Rizal takes out a device to activate quantum consciousness, noticing that something is wrong with the laws of physics and unfamiliar matters. He realizes that everything is for real, and argues that all this is either a game of Rysia, or his exile was a surprise for her as well. Razel comes to the conclusion that his task remains to save the world, and will Rizia be satisfied if he kills the Demon King? Razel wonders who the Demon King is and what he is, because there was no such thing in his world. Razel reflects that since demons are intelligent and have their own master, then maybe they are not evil. Razel realizes that because of the exile he cannot hope for cooperation and knows nothing about the situation. 
Razel decides to meet the Demon King in person. He conjures, wondering if his magic will work in this world. He performs activation detection magic, and a reconnaissance satellite appears to the room, with which you can find out the area. Razel orders him to plot a route to the location of the Demon King. The satellite flies away, and Razel decides to take a nap. He dreams of birds and the city. Razel wakes up in the morning. The printer from the satellite prints the map. Razel spins the map and notices that someone is here. Five pursuers scan the room of Razel, who has noticed them using the highest detection magic. He eavesdrops on them with magic. The pursuers are discussing whether Razel is staying at this hotel. He understands that the king sent them. Razel goes outside. The pursuers hide on the roof, recognizing him. Razel realizes that the king is against him. The pursuers recall a step-by-step -step plan, first to kill, then to bring the head to the king. Razel decides to take advantage of the killer who is aiming at him. The pursuers are preparing a shot. One of them shoots a dart from the tube, hitting Razel. Razel realizes that this is a poison that puts you to sleep in a few seconds, but copes with it with the help of magic. He falls to the ground. The pursuers stand around the body, declaring that their mission is accomplished. Razel opens his eyes, conjures a quick move and knocks out his pursuers with lightning magic. Razel conjures, telling them to get some sleep. He gets into the inventory, curiously reasoning that this item should have been there. Razel takes out a multifunctional stem cell, which is the basis for clones. Razel recalls that he has never been able to create a clone with good combat skills and makes them to train his powers. He reflects that the clone will not copy his capabilities, but will repeat the appearance. Razel activates cellular differentiation. There is a clone in front of him. Razel argues that it is worth killing him, putting him in clothes and leaving a bullet wound. The clone lies dead instead of Razel in the middle of the sleeping pursuers. Razel shakes off his hands, coming to the conclusion that he has already used magic to restore this area, and others will take care of the rest. He stretches, thinking that he had to do an unwanted job, and decides to go to the Demon King. The pursuers are moving. One asks what happened. The second suggests that their target's protective magic work that way. They notice the corpse and are surprised. One of the pursuers states that Razel is dead and is outraged that they spent so much time on him. He cuts off the head of Razel's clone with a katana and takes it with him. The decapitated corpse of Razel's clone remains on the ground. Night, a castle on a mountain, against the background of a full moon. Razel looks at it and says it's a demon castle. He approaches the entrance, where two guards are standing. One of them shouts at him to stop. They block his entrance with spears, asking what he is doing here. Razel declares that he wants to talk to the Demon King and asks to be allowed to see him. The guards are surprised to be silent, insult him with a bastard and say that a simple man cannot talk to the Demon King just at will. Razel apologizes for his visit and asks for a business meeting. The guards are at a loss. One guard repeats that they won't lift a finger to set up a business meeting for a common man with the Demon King. The second one notices his clothes and calls Razel a hero. Razel replies that he is a hero, but the king banished him. The guard asks again in surprise. Razel says that he was almost killed by the king's agents in the morning and that after all this, even as a human, being on the side of demons is not such a bad idea. The guard puts the tip of the spear to Razel's throat and says that the previous hero also declared that the enemy of the enemy is a friend. He adds that the guards will not step on the same rake anymore. Razel realizes that someone has already used his strategy, and this is a problem. He believes that so far the magic of brainwashing is one of the options. He snaps his fingers and says he's changing his question. He points to the top of the tower and calls its protective barrier weak. The guards are surprised and outraged that Razel dared to call the demon lord's barrier weak. They are going to threaten Razel again but he thanks them for confirming his guess, and the demon king really lives in this tower. The guard realizes that he has blabbed, but decides, despite the objections of the second, to take Razel on weekly. He suggests that he get through this barrier. Razel agrees and snaps his fingers, thinking that he won't need strong teleportation magic for this level of barrier. The guard realizes that Razel is teleporting. Razel winks at the guards and disappears. One guard does not understand what happened. The other wonders that Razel has disappeared. Meanwhile, Razel teleports to the Tower of the Demon King. Razel steps on the floor, realizing that this is the Demon King's room. Suddenly, someone appears from the side and asks Razel who he is. It turns out to be a young girl with horns on her head. She points her finger at Razel and repeats her question. Razel mentally notes that she has much more strength than the guards and enough experience in battles. The girl asks why there is a person in the room and why the barrier did not work. 
Razel asks in response that if this girl has set up a barrier, then should she be called the Princess of Darkness? The girl is at a loss. She introduces herself as the Princess of Darkness and asks Razel again who he is. Razel apologizes for coming uninvited. He says he would be upset if he damaged something, but the barrier is intact. The girl continues to be surprised that a person could pass in principle. She thinks about who Rizal is and what he needs. Razel introduces himself, says that he was originally sent into the world to become a hero, but for some reason he was expelled from the castle, and he does not belong to anyone. Razel asks the girl to tell her about this world. The girl is silent. Rizal asks for the last time if he should wait for an answer to the questions. The girl does not believe that the hero came to her to ask about such things. She sends magic into him, and Razal thinks that he chose the wrong method to meet with the Princess of Darkness. He reflects magic with his finger. The girl calls him an impudent man and attacks again, and Razal does the same. He says that he has no arguments to prove his case. The girl notices that he is smart. Razal does not understand what to do next. He hears footsteps. A blonde and a man appear. The blonde asks if the girl is okay. The guy notices Rizal, asking who he is. The girl warns that her attacks do not work on him. Rizal mentally notes that the abilities of these two make up about 80% of the girl's strength. The blonde calms the girl down, promising that they will now eliminate Rizal. Rizal reflects that it is better not to prove his harmlessness, but killing these two would be a step against the girl. Rizal raises his hand up, realizing that this could pass as a threat but decides to make them believe in a peaceful solution to the problem. Razel conjures, and magic envelops the blonde and the man. The girl shouts their names, calling them Zarina and Jack. Zarina feels that her head has been severed from her body. The magical vortex surrounds Jack and Zarina's necks again, connecting their heads to their bodies. Jack says he was sure he was left without a head. Shocked, the girl asks Razel about the rebirth of Jack and Zarina, but he explains that he did not think of killing them. The girl pays attention to their necks. Jack and Zarina are stunned. Razel tells them that they overreacted and quickly believed in death just because the heads were flying in the air. The girl blames Razel himself for the strangeness, because there is no spell with which you can survive after losing your head. Razel sarcastically replies that deepening into politics has dulled the girl's understanding of magic. Zarina angrily shouts at Razel so that he does not dare to insult the strongest demon lord. The girl calms Zarina down, explaining that Razel is beyond their understanding. The girl asks Zarina and Jack to stop talking like that. She suggests that Razel ask questions about their world. Razel is glad that she is ready to talk. Jack and Zarina warn the girl if he is actually an enemy, to which the girl replies that they will find out if the time comes. She adds that instead of getting bruised, it's better to think about what's worth doing for the future. The girl explains that she has a feeling that Razel can become a good ally, and asks Jack and Zarina to wait outside. Razel realizes that things are going to settle down a bit now. Jack and Zarina bow and obey the girl's order. The girl sits on the throne and gives the floor to Razel. Razel asks if it is true that the human race will soon be at the mercy of demons. The girl replies that this is a lie. Razel asks what's bothering them. The girl answers that everything and tells that for hundreds of years the demons have not increased their powers. They are only getting weaker, they have never thought about controlling people, and it is the human race that sets its conditions. She throws the bundle to Razel, who asks what it is. It's a contract between humans and demons. Razel says that he feels the royal magic from him and asks if it is the original. The girl replies that yes. Razel unfolds the contract and reads that if a person commits a crime on the border of demons, he will be judged according to the laws of people, and people will not bear any responsibility if something happens to a demon on their territory. Razel asks how they could have made such a crazy contract. The girl tells that a few generations ago, the demon king was killed by a hero, and when he died, it was clear that no one would be able to resist the hero. She explains that if they do not comply with the conditions, the hero will kill her. Razel says he understood everything. He wonders why he was called up, if there is already a hero, and maybe he has already died. He asks the girl if the hero is alive. She replies that yes, and she would have destroyed the contract if it hadn't been for him. Razel returns the contract and asks why he was called up then. The girl asks again if Razel has expelled her. He says yes, and then the girl declares that he was very lucky, because he escaped death. Razel can't believe the girl's words. She says he was called here as a sacrifice. The girl explains that people like Razel are called victims. Razel asks again and asks for more details. The girl says that about 600 years ago, when the first hero was called up, he was not so strong and could not compare with the four heavenly kings who were the parents of Jack and Zarina. 
Razel remembers these two. The girl tells that the highest ranks of the people were amazed and named the goddess who brings the strongest, and all the heroes after were equally strong. Razel notices that all this led to what happened before. The girl is surprised that he knows everything himself. Razel wonders if someone from this world has created a magical artifact. He asks if the goddess created such artifacts. The girl replies that she created it and tells that the first hero was much stronger than the demon king and the demons were defeated with him and continued to summon the others, and they called others to fight demons in this world. But when they reach the limit, they allow the first hero to absorb himself, and so it repeats. She says that the first hero is even more powerful than before. The girl conveys the words of the king, who said that he created a new hero because he did not think about the return of the demon king. The girl finishes the story. Razel thinks that if everything said is true, then the goddess and that hero are his enemies, because he was going to help Rysia, and she wants to sacrifice him. He asks the girl if he can test her theory, and she doesn't mind. Razel takes out a satellite analysis and says he wants to collect evidence with it. The girl wonders what it looks like to detect magic, and what he wants to achieve. In front of Razel is a radar with a diagram of the palace. Razel argues that their souls don't look like human ones. He tells the girl that he found traces of a magical artifact in the first hero in the palace, so she's right. The girl asks in surprise how he was able to scout the situation in the palace. Razel replies that it is easy if there is all the data. The girl says that she would also like something like this from demons. She comes to the conclusion that initially she was not needed by Razel. He agrees with her, but adds that if it were not for her, he would not have thought that the first hero could be in the palace, and also would not have known that he was a victim. The girl is embarrassed. Razel internally reasons that if he inspires the goddess to bring him home, then this is the best way to make the first hero worry. But this will not help the princess of darkness. He calls the girl and offers her to defeat the first hero with her own hands. She asks again and explains that he started the war and the murders of her ancestors, and destroying him is the goal of the girl's whole life. The girl agrees, and Razel decides that it will be so. He offers her personal training and guarantees that she will become stronger than the first hero. She asks why he goes so far. Razel explains that he needs to take action to return home. The girl asks what makes him think that she will become stronger than the hero. He says that their strength is only one-fifth of his strength, and this is a level that can be achieved with some effort. The girl is puzzled, realizing that this is not easy. Razel calms her down, because she is the strongest of her race, and everything will work out if you practice. He says it will be easier when she learns her weaknesses. The girl thinks about it and agrees. Razel notices that she is consciously approaching the case. They shake hands. Razel warns about using a teleporter. The girl is not ready. Razel asks if she knows a place to train, because he wants to see her abilities. The girl is talking about an area a few kilometers away. They set up the radar, the girl shows the approximate location. Razel advises her to hold on tight to him. She is surprised that they will fly such a distance. They gradually disappear, although the girl says she is not ready mentally yet. She is screaming. They teleport to the arena. The girl is not very well from the fact that they flew a long distance in a short time. Razel apologizes. She asks what kind of thing he has. He explains that this is a magical mirage, and for the rest of the people they seem to be doing ordinary exercises. He throws a joke that no one will see her shame. The girl thanks for the care, and is internally surprised by his ideas. Razel notices that she is ready to fight, and the girl agrees. Razel offers to fight at full strength. They start a fight. The girl discusses exactly how Razel will attack, but he suddenly disappears. The girl doesn't understand what's going on. The girl tries to focus, feeling the magic everywhere. She hears a sound and attacks in that direction. But a small ball falls on her head. The girl doesn't understand what's going on. Razel explains that the ball disappears after three seconds and you need to try to dodge. The girl assumes that this is telepathy magic, but Razel objects that he did not use anything other than amplification magic. Razel teases that he expects something interesting from her. The girl is determined to dodge, but the ball hits her head again. At some point, the girl reflects the ball. Razel praises her and suggests attacking her. The girl tries to focus on Razel's movement and decides to use one method. Razel builds a barrier around himself and notices that gunshot magic is flying at him. The girl breaks Razel's barrier and asks how he is. Razel is surprised. The girl is happy and feels tired. Razel thinks that it will take more effort to create a barrier, but he will not show any slack, because he must give his best. He gives his hand to the girl, and she is ready to continue. Razel wonders how much strength she has. He suggests starting with a moving barrier. 
The girl asks what kind of barrier we are talking about. Razel creates a small dome and gives the task to destroy it. The girl says that he doubts her abilities in vain. Razel asks to prove it. He stands inside the dome and notices that it is capable of deflecting any magic spells. The girl thinks that he is allowing himself too much and says that he does not underestimate her strength. She attacks, but does not break through the dome. The girl is surprised to notice that the dome really blocks magic. Rizal replies that he wasn't joking. The girl is outraged that maybe it just didn't work out the first time, and gets upset. Razel tries to calm her down and asks for her name. The girl laughs that he has just decided to ask. The girl introduces herself as Mercia, the Princess of Darkness, and she is grateful for his help. Razel thanks Mercia for her trust. He says her magic power is high, but her technique is lame and her attacks are weak. Mercia doesn't understand. Rizal draws a diagram comparing magic and attack techniques with a pump and water pressure from a hose. Mercia understands. He also gives an example of an analogy with a dragon, which can be defeated by a person with advanced skills. Summing up, he says that training is needed to properly distribute strength and concentrate attacks, adding that he will teach everything and she will be able to defeat the strongest monster. Mercia is getting excited. Rizal suggests starting by creating a three-dimensional dome. He says that magic domes can be of different shapes, and Mercia creates a flat weaker one. Rizal says he wants to teach how to create a three-dimensional one, and then Mercia's power will be three-dimensional and equal to infinity. Mercia asks again about infinity, and Razel confirms. Mercia asks if there is any quick way to learn. Razel says his whole life is gone. But Mercia can't wait. She asks why he's teaching her at all, if you can just go and destroy the hero. He agrees with her and explains that he wants to find out information and let the training be a thank you for opening her eyes. Razel wants Mercia to follow him into his world as an adventurer after the victory. She asks for an explanation. Razel says that there is a strong enemy in his world that is difficult to defeat, and Razel's forces are not enough for this, and he offers mutual assistance. He says they have a chance, given Mercia's drive and tenacity. Razel suggests continuing the training. Mercia is ready to learn how to create a three-dimensional dome and defeat all enemies. Razel likes her attitude. Mercia wants to ask him, and Razel wonders what it is about. Mercia tells about her younger sister who is inferior to her in strength and recently she caught a mysterious disease. And if Mercia has to leave the world, then her sister will become the new ruler. But there are few forces for this. Razel agrees to help and reflects that there may be some kind of antidote in this world. Mercia enthusiastically asks him to return to the palace. Razel asks to do without alcohol, as last time, to which Mercia objects by not drinking. The sister is sitting alone in the room, and then Razel and Mercia teleport to her. The sister is scared, but Mercia calms her down by addressing her by the name of Sissel. They are happy with each other. Mercia apologizes for scaring me. Sissel asks who Rizal is. Mercia talks about the exceptional magical power of Rizal using the example of their acquaintance and training. Razel notices that she is exaggerating. Mercia agrees that a little bit. Mercia says that Razel can heal her. Sissel is surprised. Mercia asks Sicily for a chance. She doesn't mind. Razel mentally notices that their bond is strong. Mercia is calling Razel. He gets to know Sicile and assures her that he won't hurt her. Sicile agrees. Mercia asks you to be careful. Mercia asks what kind of illness her sister has. Razel explains that due to the high concentration of magical power, her small body cannot withstand the flow of energy, and therefore her health is unstable. Sissel anxiously asks about the severity of the disease. Razel asks her not to worry and takes out an antidote created just for such a disease, but once in the body, it will remain there forever. He offers to drink medicine. Mercia calms Sicily. Sissel drinks. Mercia asks how she feels. Sissel replies that nothing has changed. Mercia is outraged, but Razel informs her that the medicine will take effect in a few days and should be given a week. Sissel discovers that the flow of power has calmed down. The sisters are happy. Razel understands that he was able to solve this problem as well. The sisters are standing over the table, and Sissel holds out his hands. She uses magic to arrange the vase into different minerals. The sisters rejoice at the magical successes of the Sissiles. Razel notices that she will be given heavier spells as well. Sissel thanks him. Mercia is crying from excessive feelings, and Sissel calms her down. Rizal asks whether it is worth distributing medicine to all soldiers to increase the power of the army. Mercia is asking about mass production. Razel says that it used to be distributed to children from poor countries, and now there are a lot of stocks. Mercia declares that she will find a use for it. 
Mercia has gone to command. Sissel asks Razel if he wants to get closer to his sister. Sissel says that he is inferior to Mercia in influence. But if Razel really wants to be with her, Sissel will stop at nothing and will do everything for his sister. Razel asks if she has any political experience, and Sissel replies that she does not. Rizal gives her a device with which she can improve her knowledge in various fields. Mercia is coming back. Razel approaches her from behind and offers a shoulder massage. In the process, Mercia notices that he wants to get her memory. Razel shows the device and says that almost all of her experiences will be recorded in it. Mercia asks that this thing can use her memory as a learning material. Razel agrees. Mercia puts on the device. Razel offers to feel the difference between the worlds. Mercia is ready. Razel presses the button. The process starts. The installation of the Demon Lands Management Simulator is being completed. Razel removes the device from Mercia and tells Sissel to press the red stone. Sissel presses. Mercia appears on the screen. Sissel learns that this is a two-year-old famine. She presses three, but nothing comes out. Then she presses two, and she gets the correct result. The sisters are happy. Razel asks if the simulator is useful, and the sisters agree. Mercia informs Sissile that she is counting on her. The next day, Razel and Mercia are sitting opposite each other. Razel announces the second part of the training and asks if she is in good shape. Mercia replies that she is fine. She asks if there is any problem that the training will take place in her private room, and Razel agrees. He offers her a device to release magical energy and explains that this thing expels magical energy from the environment, and allows only a small concentration of it to remain. Mercia asks about the effects on the body and Razel explains that if left as it is, she will die. Mercia exclaims bitterly, and Razel thinks she's still reacting violently to this. He reassures me that it usually doesn't come to this. He explains that it is necessary to keep the magic power inside the body, to control the power with the help of the body. Mercia is tuning up. Razel says that light magical power is usually controlled and controlled by consciousness, and suggests lighting a candle. Mercia replies that she understood. Mercia almost lights the candle, but it goes out. Mercia tries to light up and mentally reproaches herself for her helplessness. She makes a jerk and the candle lights up. Mercia rejoices. The candle goes out. Mercia moans annoyingly that she has already used up all her strength. Razel teases, asking if she's giving up. Mercia replies that while she can, she will try. Razel says that's what he thought. Mercia throws out a war cry. There's a knock on the door. Sissel brings tea. Razel shows the sign quietly. They watch Mercia's attempts together. Sissel hands the tray to Razel and, to his surprise, sits down opposite Mercia. Sissel pulls out a simulator. Razel puts the tea on the table. The candle lit up. Everyone is watching. Mercia is shouting joyfully. Razel notes that it's not bad for the first time. Mercia sits wearily, and Razel declares that they will slowly increase the difficulty of spells. Razel says that if Mercia wants to train attacks, let her know, and soon she will be able to move to the arena using movement magic. Mercia sarcastically remarks that she would like to master the magic of intoxication. Sissel says that he also wants to master the magic of movement, and Mercia notices that she has become stronger. Razel and Mercia are standing in the arena. The magic power is sucked into the device, but Mercia holds it back. Razel looks at Mercia's magic ball and praises her. Mercia sends the force up and praises herself too. Razel says Mercia has achieved a lot in a month. Mercia asks if there will be an exam, and Razel replies that he was just thinking about it. Razel creates a three-dimensional barrier and responds that this is the exam. Mercia is staring intently. Razel explains that their basis lies on the surface and they are also called multilayer. Mercia asks if they are protecting. Razel responds positively, adding that two-dimensional barriers, overlapping each other, form three-dimensional ones. Razel adds that they need to be built quickly, because they are easily destroyed even in the breeze. Razel asks if Mercia is ready, and she replies that she is. Mercia adjusts herself and builds a barrier pretty quickly. Razel notes to herself that her power of concentration and precision of construction are impeccable. Razel is glad that she could. Razel is satisfied with her result. Mercia praises herself, emphasizing her status as a princess of darkness. Razel suggests testing the barrier for strength. The explosion attacks the barrier. Mercia is surprised that there is not a single scratch on it. Rizal recalls that three-dimensional barriers are more durable than two-dimensional ones. Mercia admires her barrier, and Razal suggests increasing the number of layers on it. Mercia agrees. She increases the barrier, rejoices and draws Rizal's attention to it. Razel praises Mercia, saying that her barrier can easily withstand an attack. Mercia lies exhausted and concludes that all this requires a lot of concentration. 
Razel praises her again and announces that starting tomorrow they will seriously study three-dimensional magic cubes and manipulating magic. Now Razel advises Mercia to rest. But Mercia declares that she does not need rest, and she needs to learn the basics of magic as soon as possible. Rizal had expected such an answer. He says that in this case he will be strict with her. Mercia is rushing him. They're walking through the hills. Razal asks Mercia about a special place where she would like to continue training. Mercia claims that they are in this place. There is a plantation in front of them. Mercia explains that this is a food warehouse next to the Demon Kingdom in a large plantation area. Rizal says that it is a pretty beautiful view. But, in his opinion, it is difficult to maintain such a large territory that supplies the kingdom with agricultural products. Razel agrees, adding that it rarely rains in this place, and demons of higher ranks send precipitation to the plantations a couple of times a year. Razel understands why Mercia wanted to train here and asks her how much precipitation is needed for such an area. He asks her that this is not the only reason they came here. Mercia says she would like to create a multi-layered barrier to irrigate the fields with rain herself. Razel is surprised to ask if Mercia developed this method herself. She replies that yes, but doubts her abilities, since this is the first time she will use this magic in practice. Razel shrewdly informs him that Mercia wants his safety net. Mercia is afraid that instead of rain, she will set off an explosion, and the kingdom will be in danger. Razel mentally admires Mercia's tenacity and her desire to help her people. He suggests practicing creating a conventional barrier, and then moving on to the rain. Mercia agrees. Mercia is doing magic. Rizal looks at and calculates the settings for increasing sowing, stimulating growth, stabilizing nutritional value and makes the assumption that such a formula will cause precipitation. He tells her to create a regular circle and slowly enter the formula, and if something goes wrong, he will stop training. Mercia is concentrating. Magical power surrounds her. Razel watches Mercia and thinks she can handle it. Rizal reflects that the art of creating a magic circle is frightening. He is satisfied with the results of Mercy and suggests starting a circle with magic. Mercia is responding, understood. She starts the circle. It's raining from the sky. The villagers see the drops. Someone notices that this year there is a rather large magic circle, and someone thanks the reign of the Princess of Darkness. Mercia looks at the result and realizes that she was able to. She notices Rizal's gaze and asks what happened. Rizal replies that this is perfection and this year the harvest will be bigger than usual. Mercia falls to her knees, sighs and cries. Razel watches her, reflecting that even during the hard training she didn't show her tears. Mercia declares that they will not have to rely on the human race, thinking to herself that she is ashamed to cry in front of a human. Razel is surprised that there was plagiarism, despite the food supply. Mercia replies that they had to copy supplies to feed themselves. Razel realizes that if he had been late, it would have been even worse. Mercia says that God is on their side this year. She looks up at the sky and says that now the people will not starve. Razel adds that the harvest will be good. Mercia will be interested to see the faces of human exporting traders, and Razel agrees. The capital of the people. The king reads the summary and exclaims questioningly. The black-haired man, worried, asks what's the matter. The king is outraged by the 95% drop in crop exports. The black-haired man tries to explain that he contacted the demon diplomat, who replied about the growth of self-sufficiency of demons by 100%, so they are not interested in importing from the human race. The king chuckles. The black-haired man mentally recalls that once an official was executed for insulting the king, and he needs to hold on. The king turns to a blonde-haired man named Regis and asks about the equipment of the three heroes. Regis responds positively. The king orders that the demon lord must be killed, and then make a clause in the contract stating that the demon tribe must buy the same amount of harvest as last year. Regis notices that the summoned heroes are unable to defeat the demon lord in their current state. The king understands this. Regis proposes a new paragraph for the treaty stating that demon tribes cannot kill summoned heroes. The king agrees. He wants the demon tribe to break the treaty, kill the heroes, and this will be the reason to start an all-out war between the human race and the demons. Regit notes that the summoned dead heroes will not be able to be used for synthesis. The king suspects that the demons are up to something, and first you need to destroy them, and he doesn't care if one or two heroes die. Rigit bows and asks for forgiveness. The king drives away Rigit and the black-haired one. They're leaving. The king looks at the treaty and swears at the demons. He doesn't know what tactics they used, but decides to make it clear that you can't go against the human race. Banza walks along the corridor of the castle and hears the king's voice. He thinks he's heard something about the demon lord. He hears the king's orders to kill heroes, send them to synthesis in total war. 
Banza guesses that it was the voice of the king and the summoned heroes are being used for something. He goes on and does not believe what he has heard, believing that if they wanted to kill them, they would have done it long ago. Banza thinks that, on the other hand, suddenly the king really wants to kill demons, prefers to calm down and not think about it. Razel and Mercia are in the wasteland. Mercia notices that there is nothing in this wilderness. She asks Razel if he wants to have a fight here. Razel replies that they have made great progress in six months and they are cramped in the usual arena, but there are no settlements or buildings here. He suggests Mercia use her power to the fullest. She understands. Razel says to arrange a fight without restrictions, and Mercia agrees. She throws a magic spear at Razel, and he notices that simple protection is not enough and creates a hard shell. Mercia starts up and points a homing bolt at him, but Razel deflects it with a magnetic counter. All this flies towards Mercia, but she dodges and holds on. Razel decides to fight back. He's spreading a neurotoxic fog, and Mercia understands that. Razel calculates that Mercia can create the magic of the antidote, which he can. Mercia conjures, and Razel realizes that this is not just an antidote. She directs a powerful attack in his direction, but there is not a scratch on Razel. Mercia is surprised. He suggests that she check out his magic circle, and she understands. Mercia is outraged that her target designation has slipped off. Razel laughs that this magic easily overwrites the target and is not suitable for fighting people. Mercia will be hysterical that she made a mistake by rushing to make such a big move. Razel notes that it is impossible to forge a magic circle against the hero, so it is effective. Razel explains that waiting for an opportunity to attack with magic that can be quickly activated, preparing and activating magic behind the scenes that takes time, would lead to defeat, and from a strategic point of view, it is almost ideal. Razel says that if Mercia is careful, victory is hers and praises her. Mercia replies that she will try her best. They fight with their fists. They're having a snack. Mercia says she enjoyed the workout itself because it motivates her to do new things. Razel is glad to hear this because he thought Mercia could burn out. She is surprised that Razel is worried and reminds her of the promise to be a friend. Razel thinks about the fact that his former comrades were different, but agrees. Razel likes his sandwich, and Mercia informs him that Cecil and Zeke made it. Razel is surprised to recall Zeke's appearance, but Mercia calls him one of the best in the castle. Razel concludes that appearances can be deceiving. Razel is making a portal, and Mercia is getting ready to go home. Suddenly, something towers over them. This is the dragon that they prevented from sleeping. Razel asks Mercia if she knows what kind of dragons there are but she replies that she has never seen them. But he bears a resemblance to the dragons from the legends. Razel does not know about the legends, and Mercia tells him that about 10,000 years ago, the civilization that lived in this place was destroyed by a single dragon. She says that those who were lucky enough to survive the storm of destruction restored the world and are its descendants to this day, provided that they do not disturb the sleep of dragons. Mercia wants to say the dragon's name, but he gets ahead of her and introduces himself as a sleeping dragon of antiquity. Mercia is afraid that they have awakened something terrible. Razel says it's a bad thing to do because he wouldn't want to be woken up too. He suggests Mercia to hit the dragon to make it fall asleep. Mercia suggests not joking about this. The dragon growls and asks what they are whispering about, calling them little demons. Mercia is offended. The dragon says that they will regret their audacity and attacks with flames, but Mercia manages to activate the absorption barrier. The dragon does not understand what is going on, and Razel tells Mercia that she has surpassed the power of the dragon itself. Razel instructs Mercia that she can kill such a dragon in an instant. Mercia thinks about killing a sleeping dragon with her own hands. The dragon says that the defense against the attack was a ridiculous accident, and recalls the agreement according to which, in the event of the dragon awakening, the heroes of the human race should take over the extermination of the monster, and the demon tribe will be transferred to the human tribe more than at any other time. Mercia understands that if they win, this treaty will be annulled. Razel notices that she looks a lot like the demon lord right now. He tells her that this is her first unforgettable battle. Mercia exclaims with excitement that her first battle will take place with a real ancient dragon. The dragon is preparing to burn them. Mercia is preparing to end him for the sake of the future of the demons. She points a magic spear and the dragon falls. Mercia herself is shocked by the immediacy of the battle. Razel reflects that her skills have grown faster than he expected, and the dragon was weak. Mercia makes a finishing blow in case the dragon is not dead. Razel asks what the demons will do to his carcass. Mercia replies that she is using her as a bargaining chip in negotiations with people. 
but she wonders if the carcass is enough to kill the heroes. She suggests using it to make magic tools, and then the Millennial Dragon's material will not be wasted. Razel thinks about it and remembers. Marcia is interested, but Razel says he needs her help first. They're in the castle. Razel and Sissel have prepared a gift for Mercia, who is surprised that it is sudden. She pulls out a sword made of sleeping dragon materials. Rizal explains that this sword is a one-of-a-kind weapon that only Mercia can use. He adds that the sword is charged with magic circles made by Mercia's magic, so only her relatives can use it. And the sword itself forms a preserved magic circle and exerts its effect. Mercia says that she cannot accept such a thing and cope with such power. She calls Sissel and offers the sword to her, because after the first hero, a second and a third may appear. Sissel agrees, but suggests putting the sword in the vault, because she doesn't use it very well. Razel remembers that he didn't actually kill the dragon, and Mercia remembers. Sissel admires. Mercia is proud of herself, and Razel ironically recalls that she was scared at first. Sissel asks if all the material has been used for the sword, and Mercia replies that there is a surplus left, and suggests a feast. The sisters fantasize about a banquet with dragon meat and inviting the castle servants to the table. Sissel informs them that they can cook it. Mercia asks to leave the cutting of meat to Rissel, and Razel promises to make sure that the dish is cooked perfectly. A feast, a crowd of people and meat on the table. Razel notes that after so many years, the meat is tender and delicious, Mercia thinks it's great, and Sissel never thought she'd see this day. Razel and the sisters are sitting in the yard. Mercia notices that the real battle is about to begin and Razel adds that the heroes of Synthesis will be stronger than the dragon. Mercia knows, because behind every cast of heroes there is a goddess, a woman who controls people from behind the scenes, and who knows what she will do if she starts to lose. Mercia says they have to control themselves, and Razel agrees. Sissel supports the guys. Mercia tells her sister that when she leaves this world, she will leave the peace treaty with people to her, but advises not to compromise. Sissel replies that he rehearses in his head every day how he will hunt people. She wonders if she won't be able to control her power, and she's scared. Mercia is counting on Sicily. Feast, Mercia can't eat that much anymore. Razel laughs that he finds it hard to believe that Mercia is the lord of demons, and Sicil calls her a slob. Razel and Mercia notice three men at the gate. These are the summoned heroes. Fraud defines the castle as the castle of the demon lord. Rial is disappointed that they got there so quickly. He intends to teach the demon lord a lesson. Banza tries to stop him and not act rashly, but in vain. Rial is calling the lord. The guards tell them that they will never pass through this gate. Rial is rude and asks the lord. The watchman declares that he will defend the gate with his life. Razel, Mercia, Sissel are watching them through the screen, deciding to go out. Razel remembers that he should be dead, and Mercia offers a disguise. The watchman and Rial fight, but a magic ball appears before the blow. The characters don't understand what's going on. Mercia Rizal is coming down. Rizal has horns on his head. Rial says it's the Lord. Banza argues that Rial's actions can destroy their team. The guards apologize to Mercia and promise to raise an army. Mercia asks not to worry about it and wants to talk to them. Banza wonders if they might get valuable information from this conversation. Rial wants to fight, but Banza stops him and says he has an idea. He apologizes to Mercia for her behavior and informs her that they are not from this world, but he has a question. Rial asks Froda if this is their plan. Fraud considers Banza a good schemer and offers to watch. Mercia and Razel communicate by telekinesis. Mercia is outraged that after the conflict they also want to talk, and Razel notes how things are with the summoned heroes. Suddenly, Banza lists the words about the brave man and synthesis, asking if these words mean anything to them. Mercia notices that he knows the word. Banza understands that they know, too. Mercia asks Razel what to do, and he suggests that she make the decision herself. She orders preparations to begin and retires to the castle. Fraud and Rial are at a loss, but Banza tries to calm them down. Suddenly, a magic circle falls on top of them. Rial swears. Fraud remarks that he has never seen such powerful circles. Banza looks at the circle and realizes that the demons have deceived them. Suddenly, they find themselves in the audience hall. Mercia orders the heroes to raise their heads and greets them, posing as the demon lord. The characters are shocked by everything. Mercia offers to answer any questions, and Banza asks why they were called. Mercia explains that, like dozens of previous heroes, they were summoned as food for a single hero, and this composite hero is the main weapon of humans and the sworn enemy of demons. Banza realizes that they have been deceived. Rial angrily demands proof, and Fraud tries to calm him down. 
Mercia offers to be patient. Razel appears and greets the heroes who don't recognize him yet. He turns into his human form. The characters are shocked. Razel offers them something to look at and activates a video recording from the king's office, in which the king and some guy in a raincoat are sitting. The heroes notice the guy and can't remember seeing him in the palace. Mercia claims that this is a synthetic hero. Fraud does not believe and considers him an ordinary person. Razel draws attention to the numbers 39,124 and reveals that this is his first measured combat value since he came to this world. Fraud does not understand how a hero can be summoned with such force and is this really the result of uniting all the heroes of the past? Mercia says that all heroes are originally food for him. The heroes are annoyed that they will not return home anymore. Mercia reveals to them that the demons have been oppressed by humans for many years because of their strength and numbers. She realizes that she will never forgive the human race. Banza asks her for help and offers any job and even slavery. Mercia wonders what the other two heroes think. Fraud stands in solidarity with Banza. Rial eventually did too. They bow before the demon lord. Mercia orders them to die. The king in his hall reads that some adventurers in the territory of demons led to the death of the demons themselves, and now people will be charged with murder, negligence and a minimum sentence of one year in prison. The king agrees and is glad that the demons did not demand proceedings. Suddenly, the corpses of the summoned heroes fall to the floor through the rift. The king gets scared and sees holes in their bellies. He's furious. A few hours before, Misria sentences the heroes to death in her hall. They are outraged, and Razel suggests that they stop torturing them. Mercia laughs and agrees, which angers Rial, who is outraged by such behavior. Mercia apologizes to him. Rial calls himself not the smartest person and asks to explain the plan so that even he understands. Mercia asks him not to belittle himself and asks Razel to explain to the others. Razel reminds me that he is officially dead, but actually alive. The characters offer their own versions of how this could happen like special magic, hypnosis, and fast running. Rizal says that he disguised his body and is puzzling. They realize that he has another body that he killed. Razel explains that he did not kill anyone, but prepared his corpse. Mercia laughs and doesn't believe him. Fraud and Banza too. Rial gets scared because he doesn't like ghosts. Razel takes out a stem cell and shows it. Fraud says that in his world, cloning technology is developed in his world, but not so much and it is logical that he did not guess. Rial asks if the clone is alive. Rizal explains that the clone's functions have been significantly curtailed. Fraud says cloning is unethical. Banza doesn't understand the meaning, and Riola is scared of it. Razel shuts them up and tells them they have to use clones. Mercia asks if consents are needed to do such a thing. There are clones of Rial, Banza and Froda lying on the ground. Fraud notes that this is a very advanced cloning program. Banza and Rial are surprised. Rizal explains that he uses the corpses of these clones to stage the death of the heroes. Fraud says it's dangerous to leave corpses on people's territory. Banza notices that if left in a deserted place, they will rot. Razel replies that he has an effective way, and he will send them immediately to the king's office. Mercia adds that they will attach a sealed letter with her magical powers. The king's bedroom. Regis wakes up the king by running to his screams and seeing that he is surrounded by corpses. The king remembers the corpses. Regis confirms that these are the corpses of the three summoned heroes, and the king believes that the demon lord has finally crossed the line. But didn't he return the bodies too soon? Regis hands him the device and explains that it was found next to the corpse along with the letter. It looks like a hero transfer device, and the range is 20,000 kilometers. The king wonders who could have created such a device and which sage the demons captured. He asks what the letter says. Regis reads it out. Mercia writes about the dragon she defeated and the annulment of the treaty in this regard. That she considers the arrival of the heroes to be a declaration of war cancels trade and demands a revision of all treaties. The king is outraged by the insolence. Regis asks him to calm down, but the king gets even more turned on, because the demons want to make false accusations. He orders Regis to send synthetic heroes on a campaign to tell the demon lord about the war. Regis suggests sending a reconnaissance first, as there is something suspicious about the actions of the demons. But the king does not want to listen, and Regis does his bidding. The king mentally berates the demon lord and decides that it is time to end him. In the demon castle, Mercia and the heroes are watching the king. Mercia is laughing. The heroes notice that the demon lord is no different from a little girl. Razel notes that the king would never do what he was told, unless it was presented as an insult to his personality. Mercia says she didn't think how quickly and easily the king would buy into provocations. Each of the characters opens their eyes to what is happening. 
Mercia is glad that they caught the heroes before their synthesis. Rial considers the synthesis to be incorrect. Fraud supports it, considering it worse than cloning. Banza admits that he is still on edge when he heard this. Rizal notices that everyone has somehow relaxed. There is a knock on the door. Someone brought a teleportation grimoire, as well as a letter. Mercia thanks the deliveryman and informs him that if there is anything else, she is counting on him. Mercia unfolds the letter and reads it. Rizal asks if they got what they wanted. Mercia rejoices and reads that a month later, in the Menaris Desert, the king issued an order to the synthesized heroes to go to pacify the demon lord in connection with the violation of the treaty between humans and demons. Rial comes to the conclusion that the war has finally begun. Fraud realizes that he has never been so nervous before. Banza realizes that he has never fought someone who is much stronger than him. Mercia and Razel inform them that they will not be offended. The heroes are asking. Razel explains that few people will participate in the war, only synthesized heroes, which means that the probability of a surprise attack is low. Mercia declares that she is going to take advantage of this and strike back at the synthetic heroes. The characters don't believe her. Mercia replies that she and the synthetic hero will fight alone with each other. 